good thing. Okay. Okay. Is the Bible relevant? Let's just for the sake. What does the word relevant mean? Think on it. Is it for today? Is it what's yeah. going on now? It, can you count yeah. on it? It has yeah. meaning. Okay. Well, the important meaning, uh, uh, having meaning. And being, okay, have, uh, maybe even being a, a colloquial or generic. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, if something is relevant, then that means that it's important. Um, uh -huh. For one simple word, there are multiple words, but um, again, if it's relevant, then it's, it's, it's a necessity, it's important. And so therefore, that is the question. Um, then the second question, actually on, on the same page, it says, does the Bible give evidence of being from God? And I hope, you, again, you read this uh, and, and all uh, in chapter, actually chapter two is really just what, one page? Really? <laughs> so it, says, uh, it says, yeah, is the Bible relevant today? So actually, I'm not even gonna ask that everybody read all of that. There's nothing to really read. But <laughs> chapter three is where the heart of what, where I need you guys to learn this. Okay, the uniqueness of the Bible, because there are other spiritual books. There are many other spiritual books, there's the Quran, and, and, and many other uh, religions have their book. So the question is, what would you say, what's the difference between the Quran and the Bible? Can someone answer that? I've never seen the Quran. That's Anyone? 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 Okay, let's do this then. Let's do real quick. Google, who wrote the Quran? Google, mm -hmm. where did the Quran come from? Let's do this tonight. We don't have to guess about it no more. So we will know. Break those phones out. Quran. Well, your mom might, some of you might be right near Alexa. So Alexa, who wrote, who wrote the Quran? She'll tell you. Okay, in the Quran. Not the short. Yes. Muslims. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did not um, Muhammad's, um, yeah. Muhammad's, what, I guess you could call them disciples, write the Quran? Are, are you asking me or are telling me? Well, I'm asking because in actuality, <laughs> I have the Quran. Yeah, now you got it. So who wrote the who wrote the Quran? Um, wait a minute. I'm gonna tell you in a second. Muhammad wrote the Quran. That's what it says. Yeah. Uh -huh. Muhammad, Muhammad wrote the Quran. The Quran, it says the Quran was, was revealed by the Muhammad Muhammad wrote the Quran. It was revealed to him, right? It yes. Was, it was a, a, in actuality. In actuality, it said that he was in a cave and Gabriel came down and shook him. He went into a trance and gave him the message. Okay, so let's take a look. So, so now we said. know who wrote the Quran. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Quran. Uh, and and let's, we're going to talk about a con, the uniqueness of it. Well, the uniqueness of it, we know that one man pretty much did it. Well, what is more impressive one man writing the, 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 it's the this inspirational word are 40 men that wrote, that lived at different times, different parts of the world that didn't know each other from different cultures for different uh, trades of life. Which one is more, uh, which one is more impressive? The oh, well, the Bible, the, be, the Bible, because it's, com it's yeah, comprehensive it's and it's forever. You know, it's till the end of time. Agree with the same information. Yeah, but 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 that's not. But that by saying that, Sister Julie is not. It's real. That, 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 you you need a, a better evidence to that, and it's right in your book. Look right. look at that, look at where it says right. the uniqueness of it. The uniqueness okay. of it. It was written over fifteen hundred years span. Well, what page what, are you on? Where are on page you? Page twenty seven. Twenty seven. Uh, section, yeah. section one of uh, three. It says the uniqueness of the Bible. Twenty seven. All these things here is what separates the Quran from, uh, separates the Bible from the, the Quran. Quran was written by one man, while here our Bible was written by over 40, 
And it says here it, uh, in number three, it says written by more than 40 authors from every walk of life, including kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, okay. scholars. Um, Moses was a politician. Peter was a fisherman. Amos was a herdman. Joshua was a uh, uh, was a general. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Daniel was a minister. Luke was a doctor. Solomon was a king. Matthew was a collector. Paul was a rabbi. And, and, the, the, and that's that's crazy because you can't get 10 people in a room to agree on anything. But here you got 40 people that lived in almost 40 different places in 40 different mm -hmm. times that mm -hmm. agree about the same thing that there is a God that had a son, his son was Jesus and mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so, but anybody can write one spiritual book and, you know, and, and, and by themselves and, 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 and a few friends, but here, the amazing, the uniqueness of the Bible, there is no other book in the world that has done this. There's none, not one book. And I'm, 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 uh, you want to know this, there's not one book that can claim that it was written over a 1500 year span over 40 generations. So the first person that was, that was, uh, that started writing was how much older than the last? Mm. How much Hi. is a generation? Do the math. How much is a generation? 100 years, isn't it? Then. I, I believe it's, I, I think it's 10, I, and then I'm part of my mind when I say 20. Okay, 10, yeah. So, so again, so you're looking at all of this uh -huh. time from the first author to the last author, but the first and the last author agree. There's I no that. Oh, yeah, hell. Excuse me, did somebody say something? Okay, so there's no difference between the first author, there's no contradiction between the first author and the last author. So you want to page 27 should be all highlighted. It is crucial. Page 28 should be all highlighted. Look what it says. They were writing in different moods, in different moods. Who was writing in a, in a mood? What writing can you find where someone was in a mood? A different mood. They weren't happy and and, and praise the Lord uh, uh, like David. Praise him on the high sounding symbol. Praise him on the low sounding symbol. Was there anybody Jonas. that was a different mood? Set, set again? Jonas, Jonas, the prophet, Jonah, Jonah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Jonah. okay, yes, that was different. <laughs> he was on a run from God. He wasn't trying mm -hmm. to praise him on the high sounding symbols. The God ain't trying to uh, be a prophet. I'm not trying to do all of that. So each, each one of these writers were, had different mindsets. Many of them did. Uh, I think that uh, who, who was it that said I wasn't a, uh, I wasn't a, a preacher, wasn't a, I, I'm not the son of a preacher, I'm not this and that, but yet God called them. Does anyone remember who that was? Mm -hmm. I believe that's Amos, the prophet. Each prophet come had a different background. And they weren't, uh, uh, many of them weren't authors. They weren't great uh, script writers and book writers and things of this nature, but yet God called them for, their, for what they brought to, uh, to the table. And then three different continents. Not everybody was from America. Some were from Asia, Africa, and Europe. That's right. God made this thing as hard as he possibly could. So, but you got some people say, oh, uh, the, the only authors were, should have been all black, not so. Africa wasn't the only place that God dealt with mm -hmm. man. Asia and Europe as well. So no, so, so no one nation, I'm sorry, black Muslims, I'm sorry, but no, there's no one set of people that God loved. God so loved the world. world. Yeah. Okay, okay, written in three different languages. And that's mm -hmm. another amazing thing. He talking about writing a book, but again, the Quran was written in one uh, language, uh, uh, but the Bible started off in three different languages. And now it's uh, interpreted and translated into one, whether it's Greek or whether it's Spanish or whether it's English. But the original writing started off, uh, again, in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you imagine? Someone from Spain, someone from America, and someone from France writing about the same thing at different times, but even in different languages, but they all are saying the same thing. 
That's a, that, that's really the Bible is a miracle because we cannot produce that. Hmm. Talking in different languages, but yet they agree. Any question, comment, or statement? Well, isn't the Bible the most reproduced book in the world? The most yes, it is. published and most copied? <laughs> yes. Does anybody know who is the man's name that made this statement? Because you you should have ran across it or you will run across it. Uh, 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 I'm not going to say his name other than it starts with a V. But this man said uh, before he died that the Bible was going to come to an end and that, that there's all the Bible, pretty much all the Bible is going to be burned up and there shall not be another Bible upon the face of the earth. What is, is his name? It starts with a V. Does any V. Start with a V. A B. That's, that's, a, that's a man's name. He's very well known. And the reason why he's known is because the day where he lived at is a Bible print and press company. Oh. So this atheist, this atheist declared before the world that the Bible was going to come to an end. But today, God turned around and said, I'm going to make the world laugh. This atheist house now is printing Bibles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now that's the question. Did the guy pass away? I'm sorry. Did he pass away? Upon, um, yeah, upon oh, he's been dead. Yeah, his name is Voltaire. Voltaire. Vo Voltaire. Or Voltaire. Oh, Voltaire. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anybody heard of that name before? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Voltaire. Yes. Voltaire. We probably just forgot it. Um, because it should have mm -hmm. came up in one of our other lessons. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is again, I really want you to focus on to know chapter three. We need to know what makes the Bible unique because again, there's no other book, the Quran, again, which is the most competitive religion closest to Christianity. Uh, when you compare the their writing, their religious writing with the Bible, there is no comparison. You're comp trying to compare one man to 40 men, 40 men and 40 generations and, and three continents and multiple languages, there's no comparison. So you don't even have to get into a discussion. So if you're talking with a Muslim, said let's talk about the uniqueness of your book compared to mine. And we can end this in 10 minutes so we can go and get some meat. You can end the conversation in five minutes by just discussing the uniqueness of the Bible compared to the uniqueness of the Quran. There is, there's no comparison. You don't have to debate scripture. Just, just deal with the uniqueness. If you learn that, you will be a great apologist just off of that fact by itself. You don't have to argue the Bible. The Bible will, uh, can defend itself. Any question, comment, or statement? Okay, um, so let's look at chapter four, page 34. Now, this is your assignment for this week. I want you, because most of you have already heard about the canon. This is going to give you more information about the canon. Uh, okay, so we're going to look at page 34, 35. You're going to go all, up to page 37. You're going to go onto page... 41 and stop there. So just chapter four. I just I need that to soak into your mind to understand this aspect. Okay. So that this is pretty much your main assignment for next week is to read chapter four. You don't have to read it and give me any, uh, you don't have to uh email me your findings. We, we will discuss it in the class. Now, next week in the class, I'm not gonna do as much talk as I am today because you're gonna uh, bring forth and break down the canon. Each one of you, you're going to speak as one body. So mm -hmm. I can, uh, and you're going to educate Dr. Shirt. You're going to speak as one body, okay? And not at the same time, hopefully. Okay? <laughs> uh, okay, now, we, we're done with the book. You can lay the book aside. Let's go talk about your other homework. You were to last week to go into apologeticpress.com. Okay, so let's start off there. Who would like to share with us your first finding? Okay. Yes, Dr. Paula. 
Okay, um, I found the uh, I found everything that you told us to look for the uh, the alleged discrepancies in the Bible. I found mm -hmm. the section where it broke them down into Old and New Testaments. And so uh, the first one I came across really had to do with Adam. Okay. Uh, uh, Gen Gen yeah, Adam, and and um, it caught my eye because. Uh, we knew that, uh, okay, well, here was God's word, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And mm -hmm. the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Says the day you eat it, he ate of it, he's supposed to die. Well, Adam didn't die, not then. So, and I went on and I just pursued it a little bit further. So in the Garden of Eden, the Lord delivered a single solemn pro prohibition for man. God commanded Adam saying of every tree, well, okay, I already read that part about what he told him to do. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil that stood in the midst of the garden was off limits to Adam and Eve. God prophesied that disobedience on their part would bring death in the day it was eaten. However, the Genesis text does not reveal an instantaneous physical death on the part of the first sinner. Ad <clears throat> excuse me. Adam lived a total of 930 years. Takes us all the way up to Genesis 5.5. So why didn't Adam die the very day he ate the forbidden fruit? In Genesis uh, 2.17, it just repeats the scripture again, um, represents a legitimate contradiction. One would have to assume that the phrase, in the day you shall surely die, must refer to an immediate death occurring on the very day a certain transgression was taken, has taken place. The available evidence shows, however, that the Hebrew idiom, um, I can't pronounce that word properly, uh, in other words, it means in the day, means the certainty of death and not the immediacy of it. As Hebrew scholar Victor Hamilton noted, this phrase in Genesis, he gave the phrase in different uh, areas, uh, Genesis 2.17, which is the one we read. And in first, I don't know if you want me to read those scriptures, but I'll tell you what they are anyway. Um, in Genesis 2.17, 1 Kings 2, 37 and 42, they all show different examples, and Exodus 10 and 28. It's, an, it's underscoring the certainty of death, not its chronology. <clears throat> Thus, is, it is logical to conclude that when God said, in the day you shall surely die, he did not mean Adam would die on the exact date of his transgression but that his death would be certain if he ate of the forbidden fruit. Now, second problem was with the skeptic assertion that uh, uh, Genesis 2.17 contradicts 5.5, which is the actual date of Adam's death, is that it assumes the death mentioned in 2.17 is a physical death. The Bible, however, describes three different kinds of death. One, a physical death, which ends on life on earth, Genesis 35, 18. A spiritual death, which is separation from God, and that's Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Ephesians 2 and 1, and an eternal death in hell, which is Revelations 21 and 8. The fact is, one cannot know for sure which death is indicated by the phrase, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Realizing that Adam, Adam sinned against the Almighty in the garden and became dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 21, I'm, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2 and 1, 1 Timothy 5 and 6, it is possible that the death spoken of in Genesis 2 and 17 is a spiritual death. If this is the case, the reason, the reason Adam did not physically drop dead on the very day of his transgression was because God's prophecy was referring to a spiritual death, not a physical one. Amen. So when let's stop Adam, right there. So the, right. That's right. The problem, yeah, let, let, let's stop right there because I know you, it's just quite long. And, and yeah. But because you, you brought up certain things that everybody I want everybody to recognize. First of all, um, 
as, as these are possibilities of what it means when it mentions about uh, mm -hmm. the certainty of death more so than the actuality of death, which yes. is really, really good. But I also, I'm not, I often may get to this, but I want to bring this out that we can actually see the spiritual death and we see it in the fact that once they uh, were disobedient, they began to help, they recognize that they were negative. The fact that they recognize that they were negative says that their nature changed. So right. that nature changed immediately. So the fact that we serve a spiritual God, it will makes us somewhat uh, allude that fact that he's talking more about a spiritual death. And so the fact, and we recognize the spiritual death that they hid themselves. He asked you, you know, mm -hmm. why are you, hey, why are you covering yourself? Who told you that you were negative? Mm -hmm. So, so we can see the spiritual death there. Uh, so uh, that was very good, Sister Paula. Thank you very much. Amen. Someone else that read something uh, uh, that you would like to share with the class? Um, um, I did. Um, it was really uh, very interesting, and it was an uh, interesting research. Um, I worked on a Genesis one and two, specifically Genesis one, verses two and three. And then I added Genesis 2, 4 through 25. And the question here is, are these two different accounts? Because the style is different. And even in, in, um, in Genesis 1, 2 through 3, uh, it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, it goes on in doing research. Um, in this particular passage, the original Hebrew says Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, which is one of the names of God. And that was used specifically, and it's used in the Bible over 2,500 times. And it's um, it's a particular um, it's a particular understanding of who God is, the Creator, Creator God. And then going over into um, uh, three. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. And it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And here we find that the original says, is calling uh, God Yahweh uh, or Jehovah. Because of the meaning there, there's a different kind context so um and it's common for um, uh, liberal critics of the bible to assert that the book of genesis contains two accounts of the creation of the earth and actually these two accounts reflect different authors different time periods and it further is charged that the narratives contradict each other okay and in, in doing research in this, and um, I do have, uh, I, I use the King James Study Bible, and that was very, very helpful because it goes into um, uh, in depth and explains. So the two records that are supposed to involve Genesis one and two, it's evident, and of course they call it the Pentateuch, which are, is, uh, the name for the first five books uh, of the Bible. And um, they talk about, um, and it's shown that by the existence of two differing accounts or called doublets of the same event, the story of creation, uh, the view of scripture is not the exclusive property of the radically liberal theologians. It is made in its in its presence felt in conservative circles as well. Some religionists speak of the two different creation accounts 
and that is Murray and Buffalo in 1981, or the two creation hymns. One of the fundamental assumptions is that the so-called higher critical viewpoint is that the Pentateuch was not authored by uh, Moses, supposedly several ancient writers, as we spoke about before, the many different writers in the Bible. And um, it says that um, uh, Jehovah, since the name of God was prominent in certain sections, signifies Elohim, another divine name, allegedly identifying certain portions, which they call P, support purports to the priestly code, and D identifies what is known as the Deuteronomic writer. And the critics claim that all of these writings eventually were collected and combined. This theory known as the documentary hypothesis became popular in the 19th century by Jean, uh, Jean Astruc, a French physician, claimed that he had isolated certain sources and authors from the Pentateuch. The bottom line here is um, that what they finally come to talk about is that this is the same story, but it's approached from a different point of view. Okay, one, one is uh, a stylistic point of view, and the other is, um, how would you say, um, wrote that down, hold on a minute, a purposeful point of view. So it's, it's not that the, the Bible is being contradictory, it's just that different writers have a different approach. Just like uh, you can write a thank you letter or a letter to the a friend and uh, you or, or two friends and you may have been at the same thank you for inviting me to your party, but the, the, the meaning is the same, thank you for the party, but you may have expressed it in, in slightly different ways. Okay. So that was the conclusion that I came to. That okay. it, it's okay, not... let me ask you this, Sister Paula. Uh, did you uh, did, uh, did you take uh, not Paula? Excuse me, <laughs> Julia. Did you take Bible One Advance? Bible, yes. Okay, you took Bible One Advance. Okay, yes. just about everybody on here took Bible One Advance, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> because this should be really simple. Because we were able to explain that Genesis 1 and 1 is creation, verse yeah. 2 is destruction, and mm -hmm. verse 3 is the beginning of recreation. And we explain that through by putting the Bible in chrono, uh, uh, chrono, mm -hmm. the chronometrical order. So we have, by doing that, we, we studied Genesis 1 and 1. Then in between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2, we have Ezekiel 28, 11 and 12, Isaiah 12, 14, Revelation 12, 7, and then we come back to, so, so that is not really contradictory to me. Uh, and I know a lot of people will say, well, hey, that's two creations, but really there's only one creation. There's Genesis 1 and 1. Then there's a destruction that took place in verse 2 where Satan was kicked out of heaven and came to the earth uh, and fall to the earth, which brought the destruction. And then verse three is the beginning of recreation. And this is why God told Adam to go and replenish the earth. Okay, so, but thank you very much. Now, I'm gonna say this. Sister Julie mentioned a word uh, that uh, some of the authors used. They said, this is a hypothesis. Does anyone, can anyone explain what a hypothesis is? Because this is important. What is a hypothesis? This is a it's, it's a, a, what? a theory right it's a theory and, mm -hmm. and it also is a theory without in-depth study it's somebody's belief without really doing critical research yes and so you want to be very careful when someone is giving you their hypothesis in other words they're giving you their opinion and their opinion is worth no more than than than, than yours yeah but wow. that is the beginning of the research. Right, That's the beginning of it, right, the beginning of it. So today, most theologians go with 
Genesis 1 and 1 creation, because um, most of you have the date Bible, because the date Bible has it, Scopa has it, King Thompson has it. Genesis 1 and 1 creation, verse 2 is um, destruction, verse 3 is that. But I'm glad you brought that out because what it shows, what you brought out, is that there has been so many theories down through history and how, or hypotheses down through history. And so finally, because of, of your theologians are getting better at understanding Hebrew and Greek and various things of nature and putting up and doing a better um, a job at uh, hermeneutics and apologetics that they're understanding now uh, what we got. Okay, anyone else? Um, I'm trying, okay, just 632. Someone else, uh, what, what discrepancy did you read? How was the result? What is the discrepancy? Someone else, thank you, Sister Julie. Welcome. I can go. I did uh, Malachi two and five. Um, are we to fear God? And um, uh, it it I was doing my study, and the the word fear appears in the New King James version of the Bible three hundred and sixty seven times. Um, okay. Steve Wells, uh, the author of the skeptic annotated bible um he highlighted second timothy 1 and 7 and and first john 4 and 18 um versus uh indication uh shows christians are not to fear and placed alongside those verses 26 bible references that specified we are to fe fear god but it goes on to say his intent was to convince readers that the Bible's discussion of fear is contradictory. And that's what okay. he was trying, that's what he was trying to do. So okay. um, in the Bible, when you see the word fear, there's all kinds of different uh, definitions for fear. Um, you can go to uh, the word fear and sometimes, you know, it can mean terror. It can mean dreading. It can be, even mean awe, A-W-E. Um, it also uh, uh, goes to talking about reverence. Um, it talks about, and that's the, that's the noun. Um, it talks about respect as far as the, the verb. Um, it goes on to talk about um, uh, how fear is used in the different ways in the scriptures. Uh, uh, let's see, let me see here. Um, when the Bible praises men's uh, fearlessness and his need uh, to move beyond fear, it's using the term fear in a different context than the way it is uh, used referring to the fear of the Lord. In 2 Timothy 1 7, it's not about us not fearing God, but it's about not fearing for our lives while doing God's work. Mm -hmm. um, we are not to fear uh, in the serving of the Lord. Uh, fear does not come from God. We all know fear doesn't come from God. God gives us all good things. But when I got done with it um, and was going through here, uh, it ended up saying that uh, whenever different senses of the same word or things are under discussion, uh, the skeptics' allegations hold no value. Um, so because there's so many ways that you can use the word fear, um, and we already know that we are not to fear God. If you, if you look at um, uh, 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 Revelations, the first verse, um, you know, a lot of people don't, they fear going into Revelation, but the very first verse says that he wants his people to know exactly what's going to be, I'm paraphrasing, exactly right. what's going to be happening. He wants us to know. So we are not to fear what's in Revelation. We're, we're, we, he wants us to know. So um, I, doing my uh, uh, research, um, I, it, it says in Malachi 2 and 5, the prophet linked fear and reverence together in describing the attitude uh, that uh, Levi uh, possessed at one point in the past, Malachi stated 
Uh, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. The Hebrew word translated year, uh, frequently translated fear, and year is spelled Y-A-R-E. Uh, frequently translated fear also means religious awe, A-W-E. And for this reason, some modern versions uh, like the New American Standard Bible have translated Malachi 2.5. Um, so he re revered me and stood in awe of my name. And so the last thing that I had got was today God expects his people to revere him, not panic at the thought of him as a slave might fear his cruel master. Furthermore, one way a Christian uh, walks in, in the fear of the Lord, and that's in Act 9, Acts 9.31, is by boldly following in the steps of the Savior who stood fearless in the face of his adversaries. So, like I said, because there's so many ways that you can use the word fear, it, it doesn't hold any weight as far as uh, uh, being uh, contradictory. Amen. That was very good. That was very, very good. Thank you, uh, Reverend Jackson. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments, or statement thus far on the first uh, three ladies thus far that have come forth with uh, St. Paul, this is Julie, um, our, our Reverend Jackson. Okay. They were all very good at very self-explanatory. Okay. Now, everybody's not going to be able to get theirs done today. So I'm going to call a couple of names out and see if you're right, ready to do it now or next week. So the first one is Sister Jennifer Moore. Oh, please let me do it next week because these, <laughs> hey, these ladies are awesome. Man. <laughs> okay, next week for you, Sister Moore. Okay. I might have okay. researched a little bit more. Okay, how about uh, Overseer Moore? I'm getting my Moors in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Short. Can I go next week, please? Uh, okay, no, no problem. Okay, let's see who else that's on here. Uh, uh, no, not that boy. Dina Brown, could you go today? I'm sorry. No, I cannot, Dr. Short. I apologize. Okay, so I, I, I can, that's everybody. Okay, I apologize. Week, for sure. Um, okay. Dr. Wright is on here as a guest. Thank you. Glad to see you, Dr. Wright. Okay, so uh, how about um, Mother Rose? Reverend Rose. All right. Um, <laughs> I did. Um, did God approve of Rahab's lie? Wow, and, um, okay. That came out of Joshua 2, 19, I mean 9 to 21, 6, mm -hmm. 22 and 25. And so it was there saying that that um, God approved of Rahab's lie because of, first of all, it was in the New Testament, it talked about by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And that was Hebrews 30, 11, 31. And was what, was not Rahab the Herod who was justified by works when, re when she received the messengers and sent them out another way, James 2, 25. And since so the Bible's inconsistent on this subject and do these verses prove that lying is approved in some situations? And so you, when you look at this, there was four different points in here. It said, first of all, because the Bible condemns an individual for a righteous act does not mean that God condones anything the person ever did. And so you look at it just as husbands and wives can be faithful to each other despite their shortcomings, just as their sh children can be submissive to their parents and yet have fallen short of their parents' expectations. Many times while growing up, every accountable serve soul has potential to be faithful, notwithstanding their their regretful sins and imperfections. So we look at that and, and she did lie. She did <coughs> hide them. She did tell the soldiers that they weren't there. But, but you have to look at, first of all, 
she accepted she she accepted the lord she 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 accepted him but and she came from a she was a canaanite harlot and they did un, unbelievable things um uh, they burnt their children they did all kinds of, of crazy things and so and so when you look at where she came from and what she did she she said that she was she would hide these men she would uh let them go and so when the soldiers came now she could have she had three choices to make she could have said yeah they're here and they would have been dead they would have died and then she wouldn't have had to, she wouldn't have had to lie so the question is do we is it okay for us to lie in certain situations and so the answer to that would be no um the answer to that would be no, it's not okay. But it goes on to say, um, did God approve? No, God did not approve of her lie, but he commended her for her faithfulness, for, for her receiving him is why he commended her. So it's never okay to lie. And um, I, I can't keep going on, but I'm kind of nervous right now. Okay, that, that's good. That's good. You stop right there. Sometimes I say, stop while you're here. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's, that's yeah. a good lesson. Always stop while you're here. Okay, so that's very good, uh, uh, Reverend Rose. That, and, and so we want to remember that because we talked about that uh, we, when we had a course on Christian ethics, that mm -hmm. there's never a good time to lie. That God never approves a line, that He will reward her all for her faith, and and um, He sometimes and there are times that God don't always punish us according to our sin, and He did not punish her, and and we, we you can look at it by well why He why did He punish her? Well, He doesn't punish us according to all our sins either. Mm -hmm. and if He did, we'd be dead. <laughs> so we can't act like He done her a special favor. He does all He give all of us the same amount of grace. That He does mm -hmm. not give us. Uh, he give us more mercy and more grace than than judgment, and thank God that He does. So, um, so He's still the same God. As what He gave her, He gives us the same thing every day. Awesome! I enjoyed that. So next week we know who we have come. We have the two Moors that's coming, Dina Brown coming, and we have others that's coming on next week. So, uh, so uh, now this is so what you have to do. Your homework is what reading chapter four. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask those that gave theirs today, go, dig and find one more. Um, and so, so those that are doing theirs next week, again, you're going to um, uh, you're gonna come forth next week and you're still going to have to uh, come up with, because we want everybody to do two uh, discrepancies. So we want at least two, everybody to do at least two discrepancies. When you find your second one, Email that to me. You don't have to email me the whole lesson of it, but let me know what the discrepancy is, and so I know where you're coming from um, when you uh, do your presentation. So, so pretty much, um, again, just to reiterate, I need you to know chapter three. You need to know there's 40 different authors, okay, over 40 different generations, spoke three different languages, over three different continents, that over different professions, different ages, different stages, and that there is no book that touches again the Bible and you didn't so you don't have to argue with an atheist, not an agnostic, not a skeptic. The other last teaching I want to give you for those that don't know, you will probably run across there's a difference between an atheist and a theist. Mm -hmm. An atheist is a person that the Bible calls a fool because they don't believe in God. A theist is a, is, is spelled like atheist without the A, but a theist is a person that believes in God but may not necessarily be a Christian, okay? That's the difference. <laughs> a theist it may believe in God, but, mm -hmm. believe, but not necessarily born again. Amen. So let us close out, and I will see some of you guys on next Monday. If you have any other questions, comments, or statements, text me, email me later on.
Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, God, for each speaker on today. And God, we thank you, God, for allowing them to come and, and to share what revelation they had. And God, we pray for even for next week or right now, God, that you have blessed each ever speaker with boldness. Dear God, they come forth with confidence. And God, we get you blessed the new students that's got how the National School of Theology is growing. God, we appreciate how you're allowing us to spread across the world. God, we thank you for that. And we have to continue to humble our spirits as we go forth in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. God bless you, Saint. May have a smile upon you. God bless you. All right. God bless you. Good night.